welcome everyone to the Ethics and Abuse panel. And thank you so much again to John and Tiffany for your powerful and moving words earlier. My name is Emily Rutland and I will be moderating this panel. I'm, me I'm a medical student at Columbia University and I've been a member of the Sports Equity Lab for the past several years. I know everyone is eager to hear from our fantastic panelists, but in the interest of time and smooth transitions over Zoom, I'm going to introduce all of our panelists up front, and then we will hear from each of them on the work they are doing in their respective fields around this issue. Deborah L. Brake is Professor of Law, Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development, and John E. Murray, Faculty Scholar at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, where she has been a member of the faculty since 1998. She teaches courses on constitutional law, employment, employment discrimination, and gender and law. She is particularly known for her work on Title IX, including on gender equity in sports and sexual harassment and sexual assault in educational settings. She is the author of Getting in the Game, Title IX and the Women's Sports Revolution, and a co-author of a leading gender law casebook, Gender and Law, Theory, Doctrine, and Commentary. Perhaps most relevant to this program her work is her work on Title IX, that led her to co-author a model policy paper for the NCAA on appropriate coach-athlete relationships entitled Staying in Bounds, an NCAA model policy to prevent inappropriate relationships between student athletes and athletic department personnel. She is currently an expert advisor on the American Law Institute's project on principles for handling sexual misconduct between students and colleges and universities. Before joining the faculty of the University of Pittsburgh, Professor Brake was senior counsel at the National Women's Law Center in Washington, DC, where she specialized in Title IX cases and policy developments. She is a graduate of Harvard Law School, magna cum laude, and Stanford University. Rebecca Corey is a former elite Canadian athlete and five-time national champion, and the first female president and CEO of Karate Quebec and Karate Canada. At the time, she was the youngest president in the association's history and one of five women holding a similar position amongst the 190 national karate federations around the world. Her contribution to sport in Canada earned her the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, awarded personally by the Governor General. Rebecca now focuses her time on her most recent initiative, the Spirit of Trust, a not-for-profit aiming to provide holistic healing and support services to survivors by survivors of abuse in sport a cause extremely close to her heart. Brian S. King serves in the Utah State House of Representatives. He was raised in Salt Lake City, graduated from the University of Utah School of College of Law in 1985, and has practiced law in Salt Lake City since then. Most of that time, he has represented individuals suing health, life, and disability insurers and self-funded employee benefit plans. In 2008, Brian was elected to the Utah State House of Representatives as the Democratic representative for District 28 in Salt Lake City and part of Summit County. He is a member of the House Judiciary and Business and Labor Standing Committees. He is the leader of the House Minority. He is a member of the LDS Democrats Caucus in the Utah Democratic Party. He served for years on the Board of Directors for the Rape Recovery Center and currently serves on the Board of Directors for the ACLU of Utah. He has worked for a number of years on legislation that more effectively balances and addresses victim rights, criminal justice, and civil liberties. Each panelist will speak for around 20 minutes, and then we will have time at the end for Q&A from the audience. Just a reminder that the chat box will be disabled for webinar participants, but you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to submit questions at any point throughout the panel, and we will have a designated time at the end for questions. Again, I'm so thrilled to introduce these panelists and learn from their collective expertise and decades of advocacy on behalf of more equitable and just sport. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Deborah Brake. Thank you very much, Emily. I have my prepared remarks uh, and I'm ready to go into them. But before I do, I just have to say, I, I have come to this program as a law professor, but I sat with that last panel as a human being in listening to Tiffany speak, and I uh, was deeply, deeply moved, deeply awed, Tiffany, by, by your courage um, and your strength. And I also have to say deeply saddened, deeply saddened as a human being and as a mother of a high school uh, female athlete, um, it breaks my heart what you went through and so many of your peers and it breaks my heart how the system failed you in every respect. Um, and in many respects, what I am going to be talking about, the law, 
is terribly inadequate in speaking to the pain that you and so many others have been through. And for that, I am truly deeply sorry. And I wanna remain mindful of that because I have come with the tool that I have, which is the law, and that is my expertise. That is what I will speak to. But what I wanna emphasize as the overarching theme of my remarks is that the law in this area, and I'm really talking about our federal anti-discrimination law, Title IX, the law in this area must be understood as a floor and not a ceiling, a floor beneath which um, institutions may not uh, delve, but it is not our aspiration to only meet the minimum level of the legal standard. We must do better. And that is where, you know, the panel is labeled as an, a panel about ethics. I'm speaking more to law, but I want to emphasize that the ethical standards are so much higher than the bare minimum of the law. And so with that said, uh, the law has done some very productive things here in setting a baseline for institutional responsibility in putting in place some processes and mechanisms for doing better, and probably most importantly, in sparking a cultural shift in bringing these cases more to the forefront than the back burner, a cultural shift that has really been fueled by advocacy, a survivor's movement that has put pressure on the law and on institutions to do better. So let me start with how we got here by going back in time a couple of decades to talk about the development of the law. And then I'll talk a little bit about where we are at present with Title IX and a few thoughts about the future and where we need to go. So to go back, uh, to take us back to the 1990s, back when I was a lawyer, a young lawyer, I must say, at the National Women's Law Center, um, involved with many of the early Title IX cases, uh, in the early nine, Title IX cases around sexual harassment and sexual assault. The um, <clears throat> press at that moment was to get the courts to recognize that sexual assault was a form of sex discrimination and that schools had an obligation when that occurred in a, in a way that affected education, schools had an obligation to do something about it. And that really took the decade of the 90s to establish. And a lot of cases, a lot of cases that lost, but by the end of the 1990s, there were two cases that came before the Supreme Court that did establish the principle that sexual assault is a form of sexual harassment. And that is a form of sex discrimination that is covered by Title IX whether the perpetrator is an employee of the school or a student or even someone uh, in either category, um, but that has some kind of a relationship with the school and the power to deprive through assault and harassment uh, students and other persons of an equal educational environment. And that principle was established, but it was not a solid victory by any means the institutional liability standard that the Supreme Court set in a pair of cases at the end of the 1990s set an extremely high bar. And it is a, little, a legal standard that I and many others have been very critical of because for civil liability in court for damages, that standard requires, I'm sorry about the sunlight here coming through my windows. I can't seem to do anything about that in the moment. Uh, the, the legal standard requires actual notice, actual notice of specific abuse, it seems, or at least information getting very close to the specifics, to a person in an authority position to be able to do something about it, followed by deliberate indifference. And that is the standard that the Supreme Court adopted for sexual harassment and assault, whether by an employee or a fellow student. And notably, it is a much um, more institution protecting standard 
than what the law gives to adult employees in the workplace, which is much more like a negligence, knew or should have known kind of standard, and even in some instances, more like vicarious liability. So the standard um, of institutional liability is extremely difficult to meet, and it frankly incentivizes not knowing. If there is not actual notice, there is no liability. So um, with those cases and that legal standard in place, cases did start coming to court trying to meet that standard. And I will say most of those cases lost and continue to lose under that actual notice and deliberate indifference standard. And in fact, just to give a very recent example, there is a recent case from the Sixth Circuit, also against Michigan State University, but unrelated to the Dr. Nasser abuse. It's a case involving um, other plaintiffs alleging sexual assault by a fellow student. And there was actual notice, there was a complaint made, it was ignored, uh, it was enabled. And yet the Sixth Circuit held that the institution was not liable because its indifference to the sexual assault complaint did not result in another subsequent assault or harassment. In other words, under that legal standard, unless the institution's indifference results in more assault, it is not liable. Now I wanna emphasize, not all courts take that view. There is a split in the courts on that issue, but it is an example of an outlier case, I will say, that shows why it is so hard to win these cases. But even um, with this incredibly high standard, many egregious, tragic fact patterns can still win and have won, uh, including the lawsuit against Michigan State based on the Nasser abuse resulted in a settlement of $500 million and I will not pretend that a settlement like that can undo the harm. It cannot. My point is only that there are terribly egregious fact patterns that as high as that standard is, sadly really, still meet that standard. Similarly, a, the lawsuit against Penn State, several lawsuits against Penn State resulting from the Sandusky uh, sexual abuse scandal. Also, meet that standard. Many, many people knowing actual notice, followed by deliberate indifference. Um, again, settling in the millions and more lawsuits against Ohio State University for decades of known abuse by uh, a doctor treating, supposedly, male athletes settling in the millions, many of those cases ongoing. But what I wanna emphasize, not just the inadequacy of monetary relief because it does not undo the damage. I also wanna emphasize that in every one of those high profile winning cases, there were many, many, many responsible employees, people in positions of authority to do something about it, who knew and who responded with deliberate indifference. And much of the time, there is not such proof. Much of the time, there is perhaps some notice, but maybe not to the right person under the legal standard. Or maybe there's notice to the right person, but not enough specifics to put that person on actual notice. That is how high the standard is. And of course, with all of this, we really need a deeper conversation about the significance of why these fact patterns continue to occur. These fact patterns where there is a known pattern of abuse by a trusted authority figure that is an open secret for so long. And that conversation has to do with power, gender, 
insularity and the culture of sports and schools, and that is a culture that cannot be changed by law alone. But even when the cases lose, they did something important. They brought the spotlight to terrible situations of abuse that um, sparked a movement, or at least were part of what sparked a movement. And so now I wanna shift to a parallel uh, enforcement track under Title IX, apart from the courts, and that is with the Office for Civil Rights of the Department of Education. So Title IX is a federal statute that can be um, enforced through the courts with a lawsuit or, and or really, can be enforced through the federal agency in the US Department of Education, the Office for Civil Rights, which has parallel authority to go after educations that receive federal funding and do not comply with Title IX. And uh, there was another front of activity in the 1990s and the 2000s besides the courts, and that was with OCR in the Department of Education. But in the 90s and in the 2000s, OCR um, made some statements that put institutions on notice that they could be found liable for not responding adequately to sexual harassment and abuse. But to be frank, OCR did very little to enforce those statements. It was widely thought uh, in the circles in back in the 90s where I was in the women's advocacy community, it was widely thought that OCR was a paper tiger, kind of the laughing stock of federal enforcement agencies. It had the power on paper to withhold federal funds from a non-complying institution. It had never, ever done so, not one penny. But it had been on record as early as the mid 1990s and it reaffirmed this again soon after the Supreme Court decisions that it, OCR, required a higher level of responsibility from educational institutions, more than actual notice and deliberate indifference. The standard that OCR embraced for its enforcement actions was asking whether actors in the institution with responsibility knew or should have known, whether they knew or should have known. And if so, whether they failed, not just with deliberate indifference, but whether they failed to take reasonable proactive, preventive, and corrective action. And it is a, um, a standard, unlike the litigation standard, that does not reward not knowing. It requires something more proactive. The problem again, though, was OCR was a paper tiger. And so, frankly, institutions paid very little attention to what OCR said or required. And now we're moving forward in time to the end of uh, the 90s into the 2000s. Many egregious fact patterns are coming to OCR. Many times OCR does find them in violation and yet nothing happens. They enter into a settlement agreement with the institution and the whole thing fades away. And oftentimes, even with the settlement agreement, very little changes. But with the activity in the courts, with a growing, um, I think, cultural shift, at least in some circles, that there is a problem here, and probably most importantly, with a growing grassroots advocacy movement by survivors, furthered by some um, increasingly tough journalism, exposing not just the abuse, but the enabling uh, books like The Hunting Ground, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, documentaries like The Hunting Ground and books like Missoula, bringing these stories more to the public attention. Um, the Obama administration, I will say, stepped up in um, pushing its own Department of Education and OCR to be more proactive 
and create a shift in their enforcement strategy. And so the Obama administration created a task force on sexual assault and put in motion some new guidances from the Department of Education that were frankly quite a bit tougher than what prior OCR um, administrations had been saying or doing. And I won't go into all of the changes here, but there were a couple of important documents that came out in that era, a 2011 Dear Colleague letter, a 2014 uh, Q&A that followed up to that. And the um, main overriding message was that institutions must respond quicker, more proactively, more transparently when they know or have reason to know of sexual abuse, sexual violence, many of the documents talked about more broadly, sexual abuse, sexual assault, stalking um, on their campuses or even off their campuses if they are affecting the educational environment. And in addition to the guidance documents, OCR ramped up its investigations, brought more compliance reviews on its own initiative, and maybe most importantly, started publicizing a list of those institutions that were under investigation. And so this process that had been entirely secretive and with very little at stake became a public one. And general counsels were scrambling to stay off this list or if they were on this list to make it go away. The pressure was turned up. And I don't wanna overstate it because this was by no means a panacea Sexual abuse did not end on our campuses. Enablement did not end. Institutions did not suddenly transform. But I will say it did make a difference. It did make a difference in the big picture. More institutions hired um, Title IX coordinators with a background in maybe prosecuting sexual assault or at least with sensitivity toward trauma and a greater understanding. And they put resources in these offices and they staffed them with investigators. And um, they did, I will say again, I don't wanna overstate it, not a panacea, but at many campuses, a better job, a shift. And it might be more pronounced in the student to student area, depending, you know, we still had many problems where the institution protected the student assailant, often when they were an athlete, a high profile athlete, especially in a high profile program. Um, but institutions had to take notice because OCR meant business. But this level of increased enforcement activity also prompted a lot of pushback, a lot of resistance from different quarters. And to fast forward to the end of the Obama administration and the beginning of the Trump administration, that pushback manifested in a change in the direction, and I would say an about face in the direction of the Department of Education and OCR. And so early in the Trump administration, Secretary Betsy DeVos withdrew all of the Obama guidance and started sending a very different message to institutions. A message that the prior administration had gone too far. The people accused of sexual assault and sexual abuse were having their rights violated. And in this turnabout, um, the Trump administration set in motion a process for issuing new rules and regulations covering sexual harassment and sexual assault. And through this process, new regulations were issued and finalized last year. And these new regulations usher in not just a rollback of what the Obama administration did, but a reversal that goes decades past that in terms of walking back the rules and enforcement authority of OCR. And I don't have time to go through all of the changes in the new regulations, um, but I will say that um, every one of them seems much more designed um, to chill 
complaints from coming forward. In the higher ed setting in particular, when allegations uh, involve sexual assault and sexual harassment, it requires a full-blown adjudicative hearing complete with full cross-examination. There is an opening to ratchet up the standard of proof required and all of that sends a clear message of disbelieving survivors. And is it almost designed, it seems, likely to chill reports. And probably most important for purposes of my remarks, the new regulations roll back the OCR standard for a Title IX violation all the way back to before the 90s um, in, in terms of the OCR standard of new or should have known. And instead the new regulations import the litigation standard, actual notice and deliberate indifference to an OCR finding of a Title IX violation. And this completely turns the incentives back toward a cover-up. The incentive then for OCR as well is not to know. And I think that is a terrible development in terms of emboldening the enablers. If there's only a Title IX violation, even with OCR, when there's actual notice, then you don't want to know as an institution. So uh, I'm, I'm about out of time here, but what happens next? Oh, I am out of time. Um, certainly the Biden administration is going to want to um, revise this and uh, get rid of the new Trump education rules. And I think they will, but it won't be easy. And I don't have a prediction about where they will land, but it is going to take going through the full blown regulatory process to change. It can't be done overnight. And then what I'll end with is that in the end, again, remember, Title IX is a floor, not a ceiling. Ethical standards go much higher than the institutional liability or legal standards set by Title IX. Um, many years ago now, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it's now almost 10 years ago, I was involved in a project for the NCAA writing a model policy on uh, intimate relationships between student athletes and athletic department employees. And I don't have time to talk about the specifics of it, but I'll just say that the whole point of it is that Title IX isn't enough and institutions need to be following ethical standards that are true to the professional ethics of persons in authority in trusted positions like coaches, but not limited to coaches and ethical standards of student athlete well-being. Those are the overarching principles that policies need to follow. And for that, Title IX is the bare minimum, not the aspiration. Let me close with that and turn it over to um, Rebecca. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Brake. Um, is everybody hearing me okay? Perfect. Um, so thank you so much for, for that and thank you for the segue. Um, I think um, to uh, echo a little bit your initial um, uh, remarks is, of course, I have this amazing, organized, super uh, planned presentation, but I really want to make um, a, a few a few remarks first with um, when it comes to uh, the dean who welcomed us uh, with you know amazing uh, amazing words and uh, quite impressive knowledge on on uh, the whole um, area of, of abuse and and what is important for people to do and then um, the survivors Jonathan and and Tiffany um, I think that um, uh, hearing stories, always shakes things back in place. You know, at the end of the day, we do all these things for the athletes, for the people in sport who have suffered and, and we don't want any more of this to happen. And so the courage it takes to share the story, the resilience it takes to be able to go through life and, and the, you know, and, and everything else that comes with it, the trauma that they've 
had to endure and you hear it in their voice and you're probably going to hear it in mine too. <laughs> um, and it, it is something that is just unacceptable to see and unacceptable to, um, to let happen. And so I'm hoping that, um, you know, my presentation, although not uh, geared on all these, you know, um, very important legal and legislative uh, changes, will speak to you in terms of exactly what Dr. Brake mentioned, the ethical standards and what, what are um, ethical values and how can ethics or how should ethics actually govern everything we do. So when we look at, you know, ethics and abuse, um, you know, simple words, but charge words, crucial words that we have to um, that we have to make um, uh, happen together, words that need to mean something in, in, the, uh, in the real world. When you look at ethics, everyone will have, you know, their definition and their understanding of what that is, especially I'm uh, going to assume in the legal profession, ethics are a part of who you are and what you have to do and how you must govern yourself and how you must behave yourself, right? And that's what I want to say is let's just, um, uh, you know, address this and, and agree that for the purpose of our chat today, we're just basically going to say this is moral principles that govern your behavior, right? And so when you translate that to an organization is what are those um, moral principles? Do you even have any? Have you ever even thought that through? And so as a leader in, in a sporting organization, you know, it's important to understand your own ethical values and to ensure that your values and the values of uh, the organization are clear and your standards uh, and, and the way that you will conduct business will be done with those things in mind. And it will stay and remain your guiding light and your lighthouse. And that is what you will follow to conduct business. Because after all, this needs to be the way. And so we need to convince each other and, and, and to make sure that everybody that is involved in these organizations will put this to the forefront. So, you know, when, when I was asked by Professor Giora um, to, to come in and speak uh, on this panel, um, you know, it was clear that I needed to do it through the non-legal person with lived experience, you know, as a national team athlete, as an NGB executive. Although in Canada, same thing, same, doesn't matter where you're from. You know, this is for me, how can we take um, theory and conceptual thoughts and then bring that to, you know, the floor, bring that to boots on the ground. What does it mean and how can we connect all these pieces together. And 25 years in amateur sports, I uh, started when I was two, I'm kidding. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, every single issue that comes to you is you use the rules and the principles that govern what you do. And then you have to use your ethical compass to decide how to do it, right? And so the what to do and the how you do it. How, how you behave and how you, you, you conduct yourself, uh, crucial, you know, crucial, crucial. You, you, of course, inherit, you know, a culture, a structure and rules uh, when you come into a, a position of, of power of leadership, whether it's director of athletics or a CEO, it doesn't matter. Even as an athlete and a participant, you're a leader in your own right. And so you have to understand that you have a responsibility to you know, to do as much as you can. And as a leader, well, you dictate the terms, right? As the head of a program, you dictate the terms. And, you know, leadership comes from the top, but it needs to be embraced by the bottom and it needs to go through all the channels. You can't separate it. It doesn't work in silos. Everything needs to be embedded. It's like fragrance, you know, you put fragrance in the room. It's everywhere. Your clothes smell it. Everything smells it. Ethical values need to become your fragrance, basically. And, you know, at the end of, of all of this is how do we make it second nature, make it a habit, you know, make it um, really embedded? Because 
we've said this before and John said it and Tiffany said it and many other survivors have said this because we know better. We are required to do better. There's no more excuses of uh, I'm not informed, I didn't know it and you know, none of this is an excuse that can fly anymore. And so of course, education is super important. But what I mean by that is we know better, we must ensure we do better, period, end of story. So when you look at abuse and, you know, I'm not going to go into details and, and, and talk about, you know, all the different things that are connected to this. There's a ton of research that explains things very intelligently and more accurately than the information I'll give to you today. But certain things are important to highlight. So, you know, society um, has uh, statistics in abuse and sexual abuse that, you know, will make your jaw drop. One in four girls, one in six boys fall victim to some level of sexual violence. Unacceptable, just simply unacceptable. At the end of the day, we're a microcosm of society. And, and then we will have issues that will affect boys and girls, young boys and, and young girls and, and adults. And that's a really, I know other people swore on that. Um, on, on the panels earlier, I'm going to try and refrain from using really bad words, but damn, that's a scary statistic. And I have a little boy and he's six and I don't want him to be part of that horrendous statistic. I told him this morning, I'm doing this talk and all these people are here because they want to make sure that, you know, you have a safer um, go through. Your path is going to be a little bit more secure. And, and so, you know, when you look at um, the sexual abuse piece in the realm of, it's only 20% from research in Europe, in, in North America. So imagine the rest of the pie, you know, verbal abuse, physical abuse, neglect, all these, uh, all these pieces that, by the way, still have long lasting and life lasting impact on a person. Um, and so at the end of the day, abuse doesn't discriminate, you know, it doesn't care, uh, the color of your skin, the gender, your sexual orientation, the money you have in the bank, the parents, none of that matters. Now, granted, when you're in a more vulnerable position, you're a youth athlete, you're an athlete with a disability, you're in, in a country that doesn't have any regard for human rights. So all these things, of course, increase the risk of you, um, being abused. And then, you know, diminish even more the layers of safety that are around you. But nonetheless, no one is immune, no organization is immune, and, and no one is really, um, you know, secure uh, on, on, on the face simply of who they are and what they stand for, is what I'm trying to say. And then when you look at, you know, what your CDC in the U.S. has, has shown through their research and through adverse childhood experiences, you know, they looked at 10 things that affected. I'm sorry about the airplane. I'm near an airport. Um, and so, you know, they looked at 10 things, five of which were the abuse pieces that we've talked about. Physical abuse, psychological, emotional abuse, neglect, physical neglect, et cetera, sexual abuse. All these things, plus household dysfunction, have an impact that will affect your health forever for your entire life. Um, and so, you know, it's really important that abuse can be everywhere. Abuse can affect people forever and you have to deal with it. You have a responsibility to deal with it appropriately. As, and when you're made of it, made aware of it, you have to act and, you know, when you know, when you think there's something, at any moment in that realm, you know, don't let the needle get to the red, you know, make sure that you act right away. So you look at governance, you know, I come in, I'm the head of a federation, an association, a club, doesn't matter what, you have your responsibility, you know, you're not for profit, you have a board and you have fiduciary duties, I'm sorry for my English, and you have your duty of loyalty, you have your duty of care, right? 
And I think I'm going to use Dr. Brake's uh, phrase. That's the floor, not the ceiling, right? And, and so how can you make that be more of, you know, something that you, that you look at and that you embrace? And so you have to absolutely add values to your organization. And then you have to walk your talk, you know? It's one thing to put things on a paper, put things in a strategic plan, have nice banners, uh, or tell your athletes that you're protecting them. And then when push comes to shove, you look the other way. Yeah, no, that's not going to work. So you have to be cognizant first of the fact that you need those values. Then you have to develop them. And then you have to make sure that everybody understands them and wants to live by them. So what do we stand for? What do the leaders? What does the leadership stand for? What do we? How do we achieve our goal? You know, uh, how do we conduct ourselves? And then, nothing short of how we need to conduct ourselves in any situation is the level. And um, you know, my husband told me not to talk about politics, but I will just say, when President Biden was swearing in his thousands of staff, and he said, "If you're disrespectful, you'll get fired on the spot." So, you know, come to some kind of something like that. When you cross that line, that zero tolerance policy that, you know, we heard about earlier, that's it, you're done. And so, you know, I know this is easier said than done. I get it. You know, I was in the shoes of, you know, going to try and clean up an organization, make something of it, make sure that we had a plan, we had goals, but most importantly, the first thing I always do when I get in an organization is what do we stand for and how are we going to conduct business? Because all the goals you can have in the world, whether performance or events or financial, you need to know how you're going to get there. Are you going to go rob a bank or are you going to run events to make money? You know, it, it, it's a silly example, but it really boils down to that. At, at the end of the day, you know, when you look at how you put ethics and abuse together it's because sorry second plane um you know at the end of the day you need to put it all together because you want to develop your organization to be best in class you want to be in the news because you're awesome at all these things not because you look the other way and you didn't believe somebody because now you know better and so you should do better and so, you know, what's a best in class organization? Well, I think um, it should be ethically led. It should be trauma informed. It should be expert supported. And you should have safeguards at the center of it. Everything you do, and we talk about athletes, but it's really about the human in sport, right? Because officials have issues of, with abuse. Coaches have issues with abuse. Administrators, I can tell you a few stories. Have been um, abuse, you know, uh, abusive relationships, because anywhere there's a power differential, you know, anywhere that is there, you will have uh, a context where you could potentially have an abusive relationship, an abusive, um, you know, environment. And so once you have these four things laid out, well, then you're going to be golden, right? And so, you know, John Vaughn talked about the why this morning, his why. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you the why I think, you know, an organization needs to do this this way. A few things. Safeguarding is linked to abusive behavior and abusive behavior creates tra trauma and trauma is life changing and not in a good way. It's life lasting and that's not in a good way either. And, and so we have responsibility and that duty to the people within the organization. And so you cannot stand by, you cannot enable, that's a no-no, right? And so at the end of the day, when you live through trauma, you know, your chances of long-term health increase dramatically. So as an organization, this is the biggest why, because you don't want to be responsible for the trauma and the life lasting impact that this has on the people that come through your doors and you want them to have great memories and great learning experiences and all of these things, you know, because we talked about elite sport a lot, but at the end of the day, community sport is bigger in numbers. And so we have to embed these things sooner, earlier, at an early stage, 
So when a child goes through that, when they're six, 10, 11, 12, when they get to 17 and somebody acts like a jerk, well, no, unacceptable. That's not what sport is. And so, you know, to, to be able to have them live through positive in order to then become the ambassadors of, you know, the, the great um, and the pleasant sporting uh, experience. And at the end of, of the day also, we need the ethical standards, you know, because more than half, almost 80% of issues will never rise to the level of criminal justice systems, will not rise to the level of, of even civil litigation. And so we have a responsibility in an organization to ensure that we have what it takes and we have the, um, the, the steps and the due process that will still enable us to do the right thing and behave the right way. Um, because we have all these issues that, you know, at the end of the day, we'll never see the light of uh, a courtroom and, and uh, we'll stay in our house and we'll have to be dealt with in our house. And so lastly, which we've said before, because we know better, we must do better. So when I think about concretely, you know, boots on the ground, what does that mean for a, an organization to become a best in class? Well, the how is how you build your three E's. How do you build your execute, your engage, and your, your enforce? We execute things with very concrete tools that we have, and that's a hiring plan, a recruitment plan. When you bring on people in an organization, you check who they are, not just a background check, not just a vulnerable sector check, you have to have a third print stack. You have to Google them. You have to look at the social media. You have to make sure that your contracts, once you onboard them, will include a whole bunch of things that they will need to do. They need to understand. They will sign uh, you know, the contract understanding what their role is, what the values are, and how they need to behave and must behave. Otherwise, the door's there. So all these things need to be looked at and planned, and they need to be done uh, the, the correct way. But they need to be done. You know, a lot of organizations don't even do three quarters of this. And they think a background check puts a check mark next to the, the thing and they're like, yeah, we're good. You're not good. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, you need to do that. The policies are crucial. As you know, from the legal perspective, you guys live and breathe this stuff all the time. And policies have to be centered around the safeguarding. That's the main thing, embedded by your values. They have to be enforceable. They have to be understood by the, by the community. And they have to talk, and they have to talk about the main things that are important, the relationships uh, in the power differentials, the communications rules. So not one person talk, talk to one person on, on the social media or on the message, discussion with the minor on your own. The rule like we have in Canada, at minimum, two adults with a, a, a young person. So you can double check yourselves and you can protect yourselves, right? And at the same time, it's a safeguard for, for the participants. And the, you, have to, you have to basically ensure that you have a, a travel policy and you have an extremely robust code of conduct that is connected to your discipline and complaint. When you engage, you know, the second E, you engage, you have at least six different clientele in the sport world. The officials, you've got the, the administrators, the volunteers, the parents, the, the athletes, the coaches, and then everybody around the, the, um, the athletes. So coaches, trainers, all that stuff, right? What we call the integrated support system. And all of these clientele need to be educated as uh, tiffany said educated on what are the signs what are the abuses what are the things that you can do when you see something what are the policies that govern your organization what are the reporting mechanisms sanctions and you know one thing that we've been working on is something a little bit more concrete a bit different is we want to start doing case studies for administrators or coaches or people in leadership position and have them basically deal with an issue that is not a real issue, but have them walk it through. You know, what do you do when you get this letter, when you get this email, when you get this phone call, you know, and, and then have them walk through it. The same way we do case studies, the same way you do debates and mock uh, courtrooms in law school. We need to have people walk it. Because when you walk it, you actually can see 
where the gaps are and where we have issues. So let's put that into you know, a more concrete and practical way to educate our people. And, and it'll really embed what needs to happen you know, once they've walked it through once or twice, uh, even if it's just training. And you know, awareness campaigns reinforce the cultures and the ethical standards and the values that are connected to that. And, and so at the end of the day, that's an important piece. Survivor services, which is something that is very close to our heart and something that we don't see often of. So have that. The last piece is the enforcing. And the enforcing, you know, we can talk for days on this stuff. But at the end is you need to have a system that at least people can report. There can be an uh, independent way to, uh, to make a complaint, have an investigation, have some kind of answer that comes out of this and with some sanctions. And I think the, um, you know, the, report, um, uh, the repertory, uh, the registry, a registry with issues, you know, that's something that maybe each organization can at least maintain. And that can be part of the check-in uh, when, when people hire, you know, uh, staff across the nation in the various sports. So at the end of the day, you know, you remember ethics, ethical standards, values, checks and balances in all of your areas. Because, you know, uh, one of my quotes is from uh, a Roman emperor, and he said, paraphrasing a little bit here but what echo what you do in life echoes in eternity and so you don't want to be on the bad side of history here you want to be on the right side and you want to be able to behave the right way and to conclude here i'll just say i'd like to uh, add to the call to action that you know john and tiffany uh, both talked to and my call to action for organizations for anyone in leadership in sport with you know athlete athlete services uh, coaches uh, administrators especially is you find a way to include survivor storytelling and you have to listen to stories and then you can go to your meetings and start working on the policies because once you hear that um, I think it's going to put your eyes in front of your sockets and you're going to be able to do a much much better job and it'll, um, it'll be very fresh in your mind. So I would really encourage everyone to make sure that you have survivor stories that you can access, whether live or recorded sessions, and really include that in your education programs. So I'll call on you guys to, to do that, and it would, be a, it would be a very interesting thing. And on that note, I will pass uh, the presentation floor to uh, Congressman uh, Brian King. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, although I'm not a congressman, I am in the state legislature, but uh, thank you for, I guess that's a promotion. Some would say you've insulted me, but I won't take it that way. <laughs> um, it's really an honor to be a part of this panel. This is such an important topic, such an important issue. And I have uh, worked, had the pleasure of working with uh, Professor Gura now for a number of years. I first became uh, introduced to him as part of his initial uh, book uh, about the Holocaust and uh, it being a crime of complicity. And of course that had to do a lot with bystander intervention and enabling behavior by bystanders and bystanders and their inaction. And he and I spoke frequently about what could be done to address this issue as Rebecca just drafted it, as just framed it, which is the idea that um, how do we make words have meaning? How do we take our ideals and our ethics and our morals and, and translate them into uh, actual uh, a, a parameter uh, for conduct and a, a framework for prosecutors and when they choose to charge crimes uh, against individuals with knowledge who have acted in, a, in the kind of uh, deliberately in different way with callous uh, disregard as Professor Brake was talking about earlier today. That's a challenge and it's sort of a rubber hits the road moment when we're talking about some of these uh, things. And uh, I've worked on this in this area now for three or four years and three or four separate legislative sessions and I just wanted to take a quick moment and, and tell you all about how we've tried to approach that, how to balance these 
competing considerations in a way that's acceptable to my colleagues in the Utah State Legislature and my defeats, basically, because we really haven't passed statutes, uh, passed any laws that have accomplished this in a way that was um, satisfactory to the members of uh, the Utah State Legislature. But I think, uh, despite that, I think that uh, I have, uh, we've made a lot of progress in, in moving people and in thinking ourselves about the best way to incorporate these kinds of morals and ethics and ideals into a practical framework that works in terms of protecting victims, in terms of requiring personal responsibility and accountability, in terms of putting restrictions and limitations that are reasonable in the context of criminal charges and uh, the criminal process. And I think as we continue to think and to talk and to legislate and to move forward uh, with real deep thought and a good faith commitment to make progress in this area that we're coming up with, we're making, we are moving the ball down the field in a positive way. So kind of the beginning point from my perspective is this presumption that exists. And I learned this in law school and many of the people on this call, of course, are either in law school or have been through law school or uh, intimately familiar with the kind of presumption that I'm talking about where the presumption that I learned in law school was that inaction does not and should not uh, be a crime and it shouldn't be charged as a crime. We have some exceptions to that. You can ask Al Capone about it. Failure to file income taxes is a, an exception. And uh, so we know that there are times when inaction can lead directly to criminal consequences and we're okay with that. But for the most part, the sense is that when we want to talk about criminalizing inaction, we're on thin ice as lawyers and as legislators and as prosecutors thinking about charging uh, crimes in this area. And rightly so. I don't have a problem with that. So, um, but there are situations where you have such a level of callous indifference or, or deliberate uh, 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 disregard that you can and should, I think, most reasonable people, I think, would say that we should charge. And that's one of the things that uh, Professor Gure in his, in his writing and in his thinking and in his speaking has sort of tried to convey is that lines can be crossed that should allow us to feel comfortable doing that. So we drafted a bill, uh, he and I working together with the bill drafters up here at the Utah State Legislature, a very talented group of individuals who have as their profession uh, drafting legislation, put together a bill a few years ago that we just called in a shorthand way, the 911 bill. And the 911 bill was that basically, if you have personal knowledge of a emergency or a accident that is causing seriously bodily injury or has caused immediately previous to you gaining personal knowledge of it has caused serious bodily injury. And you have the capacity without endangering yourself or anybody else to call 911. You have access to that technology uh, that you have a legal obligation to do so absent some uh, mitigating circumstance such as privilege or uh, an obligation not to call or uh, again, if you're it's going to subject yourself or someone else to harm in doing so. Some unusual circumstances, but nevertheless, that you could be charged with a crime if you fail to do so. And um, we talked a lot about this with my colleagues up here. We ran it through three committee hearings in three successive years, each time getting a favorable vote. And then when we took it to the floor of the House, uh, we lost on a narrow vote each time. Each time for these bills, that we presented them, we came up with more definitive and uh, identifiable and uh, I think effective restrictions and limitations on the prospect or the possibility of prosecutorial uh, discretion being abused. Cause that was one of the things that my colleagues were concerned about. So we came up with some guardrails that I thought were very good and put them in the bill. And one of the reasons that I was arguing that we should pass this bill with regard to individuals who were vulnerable because of uh, their involvement in an accident or an emergency that was subjecting them to or had subjected them to serious bodily injury is we already have in Utah code a couple of provisions that are analogous and that um, in fact don't have the restrictions and limitations that we were trying to put in this 911 bill. 
for years, Utah has had in its code, and Utah is not the only state that does this. We have a few other states that do the same. They have, we have here in Utah a provision in our criminal code that says, if you have reason to know, quote unquote, of the abuse of a child or the abuse of a vulnerable adult, you must report it. And the failure to report it when you have reason to know can subject you to a class B misdemeanor. So we were saying, look, this is a modest extension of what's already existing in Utah code. And uh, last year when we debated this, I said, look, if you don't want to pass this bill, that's fine. But what I'm going to do is go back next year and put these guardrails into the existing portions of the Utah code that deal with vulnerable children or vulnerable adults and abuse of a child. And the bill was voted down on a narrow margin. And so this year uh, we got together, Professor Gore and I, with our bill drafter here in the Utah State Legislature. And we said, okay, let's, we're, we're, we're listening. We hear the message. You want to put in place better restrictions and limitations on prosecutorial discretion. Let's go back and fix these existing sections of the code to make it more likely that an individual who fails to report, despite having reason to know, will not be subjected to criminal charges except under certain circumstances, namely that they uh, could have and should uh, were in a position to report and that they had a level of knowledge on reporting that would could have subjected them to the criminal uh, uh, potential criminal penalties that were existing in the statute. So we basically put the restrictions and limitations from the 911 bill into the first draft of this bill that deal with the obligation to report abuse of vulnerable adults and children. And it was really interesting. Once that bill draft became public, and that happened maybe three weeks ago, we had the Department of Children and Family Services folks at the state of Utah. And we had the Attorney General's office at the state of Utah. And we had others who were involved with child welfare and the welfare of uh, vulnerable adults come to us and say, hey, we're very concerned about this bill of yours. And we sat down and had a good meeting with them and said, why? They said, because we're concerned that by taking out reason to know, you are making reporting when it doesn't rise to the level of an outrageous or egregious or obvious circumstance of abuse, uh, you know, you don't have that level of facts available, but there is some suggestion of abuse going on in a way that uh, should be reported. And we thought about that. We had a great meeting and uh, I said, well, look, I take your point. I don't wanna reduce the levels of reporting. They said, we wanna have over-reporting if we wanna have anything. We're not going to go out and give people a hard time if they report in good faith and then are found to have reported in error. And so um, I took their point and we went back and we've got a new draft of the bill that's put together. It's HB 218. The new draft hasn't been made public yet because we're still running it past some of the same people that we met with a few weeks ago. But basically what we're doing is putting in place sort of a two tiered approach to how we deal with the reporting of vulnerable adults and children who uh, individuals suspect have had uh, abuse going on or know that abuse is going on. And that is we're leaving in place the reason to believe language in the existing code, but we are, so, so in other words, we want people to report if they have a reason to believe but we are putting the restrictions and limitations in the guardrails in place when an individual uh, knows uh, of abuse and fails to report we're saying that you have to uh, uh, before they may be charged criminally there have to be certain uh, circumstances that exist namely that there has to be some degree of knowledge of the abuse and the prosecutor prosecutor has to find before charging that there is a knowledge of that abuse. And uh, we're not putting in place any restrictions on the ability to uh, hold someone uh, without the ability to be charged crim or not criminally, but civilly for failure to report uh, effectively if they screw it up or uh, there's no ability to sue someone who reports with a reason to believe in good faith and it turns out that there was not abuse taking place. So the bottom line is we're, we're trying to accommodate both ends of the spectrum here. We're trying to encourage reporting when there is a reason to believe and uh, make sure that individuals who may be abused because they're vulnerable, because 
they're above, the definition of a vulnerable adult, uh, someone who's not able to take care of themselves or uh, is suffering from Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia, or a child who is vulnerable because of their status as a minor, that those individuals are likely to have any abuse that is suspected in good faith reported and brought to the attention of authorities uh, as quickly or more quickly than that, that has occurred in the past, while at the same time uh, allowing for criminal uh, restriction, restrictions and limitations on prosecutorial discretion for individuals who with callous indifference or deliberate uh, disregard fail to report. There's a balancing on all these things in other words. And what we're trying to do, I think from a legislative perspective is get more specific about when individuals are excused from reporting for purposes of the possibility of being charged with a crime and more specific about when they, the prosecutor should be thinking hard about charging with a crime because the factors showing deliberate indifference or callous disregard in fact are in place and giving prosecutors a better tool for charging in, in the situation when that those circumstances exist. So. All of this is by way of thinking more deeply, thinking harder, thinking more uh, effectively about how to reduce levels of bystander uh, indifference, about complicity, and about enabling of uh, criminal behavior and abuse by others through the uh, indifference and disregard of bystanders. So that's really all I have. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, it was so interesting to hear from all your different perspectives on this issue. And I know for me, it raised a lot of really important points and I'm sure it did for the audience as well. Um, so we're gonna move on to Q and A right now. And just a reminder that everyone can submit questions through the Q and A chat box um, if you have any for the panelists. Um, I think just to start off, um, you know, Professor Brake, you talked about this consistent and known pattern of abuse by authority figures um, as being partially reflective of the culture of sports that can't necessarily be changed by law alone. Um, and this cultural piece seems to be something that's really important. Um, and for example, Rebecca, I'm thinking of, you know, the importance of hockey in Canada, for example, and for youth sport. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, this can be a question for all of the panelists, um, in cases where sports are so tied to culture, how do you navigate and work within those dynamics to ensure that athletes are protected from current and future abuse? Well, step in, even though I honestly don't have the answer to that. There, I don't think there is a simple answer to that. I do think precisely because the um, it is so thick in the culture of sports this culture of insularity secrecy uh, loyalty to the team and the authority figures above all precisely because of that culture we do need strong legal and strong ethical principles that um, intervene we cannot just leave that culture alone and say it is what it is now that said, it's very difficult, even with strong legal incentives and strong ethical rules, very difficult to break through that culture. So I, you know, I think we need to bring a sociologist on the panel or, or something. I don't have the answer here, except to say that um, precisely, the, the, the more we know about the culture, the better, the more we expose it, the better, the more we expose the harms of many aspects of that culture, including by the way, things like hazing uh, I mean, there are, you know, in many sports, there's a, a culture of, you could say, toxic masculinity. Uh, that's true for some women's sports as well as men's sports, uh, of, of harmful things going on that it is enculturated into the student athletes to tolerate because they are supposed to. And the more we expose all of that and focus on student well-being and how that should be the pervading value the better off we are. And so I just think we have to approach it holistically, make sure our legal incentives are right, make sure our ethical standards are strong enough and clear enough and um, embraced. And then we have to you know, do all of the cultural work of taking a hard look at what's going on. Rebecca said something earlier too, about she didn't wanna have politics enter into this, but the reality is we've seen a lot of um, action in the last few months and years that uh, 
deal with this kind of enabling and complicit behavior in the political context, regardless of how you feel about it, that I think is helpful in moving the ball down the field on this in the sense of sensitizing people to how it works, how real it is or can be. And the more we think about it, the more we are aware of it and how it happens in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it's politics or whether it's school behavior or whether it's athletic teams or athletic programs, the more we're focused on it as a problem, I think the more likely it is that we're going to make some progress in how we do deal with this and move forward with this. So I, I think that's the kind of thing that uh, is, is important for us to continue to do. We've seen a lot of it. We need to see more of it. Right, yes, exactly. And to build on, on, on both of your comments, um, you know, cultural change is just one of the hardest things that you can ever set out to do in any organization for that matter. It doesn't matter if it's sport, it could be, you know, I'm going to work at the pharmacy and I don't like the way they treat employees. Like, okay. So, I mean, the, the road is long, um, but knowledge is the key, right? And, and understanding now what are the parameters, what are the lines, and, and having the discussions. You know, over the last few years, I've been to so many conferences that talk about abuse in sport, human rights, all these different angles. And, and you know, the, the, the professors who present and, and who talk about these things, um, you know, they always talk about um, the culture of the performance, the no pain, no gain, um, all these things. So I think it's definitely there's something that needs to be done at the sport level in terms of the technical and the how we motivate people to to train etc you you have to get coaches who believe in motivating athletes without you know degrading them you have to um you have to talk to athletes who have lived horrible hazing situations such as some of the hockey players in canada who recently uh came out and, and are suing you know ontario hockey leagues and, and things like that and they can tell you lots of stories about that um you know but learning from what the military has done and how they have uh, tried, and they're not there yet, but how they're trying to change their culture around all of these things, right? And, and, and how sport has looked at military and, and basically emulates a lot of the really uncool things that they do uh, because they think it builds you up. And, and John Vaughn said this this morning, right? They deconstruct you because they want to reconstruct you. And so they, they break you down to rebuild you. So you can, you know, be the, um, you know, be the, the athlete that they want you and they need you to be. So I think the language needs to change and, and, and the, the perspective. And so the cultural piece is, is huge and the conversation needs to continue to happen. And you need to have all the right players, but you have to find role models. You have to find, you know, people who are doing things the, the, a better way. You know, we have uh, coaches in, in Canada uh, who coach snowboard and, you know, he coached um, acro ski, um, JP Richard, amazing guy. He talks about motivation and he talks about how can you motivate an Olympic athlete to get a gold medal, you know, um, but in the right way. You don't need to scream at them. You don't need to belittle, belittle them. You don't need to call their dog something, whatever. You know what I mean? So I think the conversation needs to happen now that we know we must do better. And, and that's really what it comes down to. And you get everybody engaged in that conversation to find the solution, uh, like Dr. Brake said. And, and I think every piece is important. How the media portrays things, how, um, how you deal with a PR situation in an organization, and then how, how you want to change to still be amazing, bold, courageous, uh, but not, you know, with the wrong methods. So we can still be champions. We, we don't need to um, pe make people cry. You know, there's no need for that. Athletes put enough themselves, okay? They put enough pressure on themselves to become A players and A performers. Um, we don't need the added nonsense. So do it in a different way. Motivate people with positive things, period. So that's what I say.
Thank you. Yeah, and we have a question in the chat. Um, it says, it's very common for abused athletes to remain silent because of the lack of trust in reporting systems. And I think, you know, in talking about the culture of sports that's really ingrained in athletes, um, there can be this um, hesitancy to report. Um, this person's wondering, are these facts taken into consideration um, in the United States when, you know, perhaps implementing legislation around um, this issue? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, th those are tough things because you're talking about cultures as we've been discussing and you're talking about subtleties and nuances of human behavior. I think that we have to put in place as for purposes of drafting legislation um, uh, some fairly bright lines and some fairly high standards before charging with criminal conduct. So but but having said that, when you have an aggregation of circumstances such as you had with the Nasser case at Michigan State, I mean, it doesn't really, you know, it reaches a point where any reasonable person can say this is far beyond what is acceptable or even could be seen as acceptable. There's so much enabling and facilitating behavior going on that any reasonable person would find objectionable. But I, I think it's this is an area that, as the lawyers, we all say all the time, is very fact sensitive. But um, if, if we legislate carefully, we can come up with better language in statutes to um, help us do a better job of identifying those circumstances where charges either should be brought or conversely, shouldn't be brought. I would um, say something also focusing on the internal reporting as opposed to the criminal law side of things, which I'm happy to defer to others on those. But um, I, I think that the question is uh, a, a very important one. And it's completely the case that much of that fear of reporting systems is rational, very rational. And, and that's exactly what was prompting the shift in the Obama administration to um, strengthen Title IX's enforcement mechanism to set um, more precise rules for how internal reports of sexual abuse and sexual harassment must be handled. And so when the report, when the reporting system is the internal one, Title IX has something to say about that. And it really was the stories that came out of the case law and all the reporting in the 90s and in the 2000s that showed um, institutional betrayal, I mean, flat out betrayal that prompted this movement of survivors, um, the, the strong journalistic reporting and ultimately persuaded the Obama administration that if schools are going to do better, we need to have stronger incentives from OCR. And so the OCR guidance from that era set in place a lot of guardrails, you could say, you know, controls that institutions would have to follow so that their processes would be structured to work better for survivors. And again, I cannot say that that all worked perfectly. I will not say that, but, that, but I think there were some positive changes made that did help make the reporting and the processes that follow work better for survivors. So it's a rational fear and it is absolutely an important piece of the, the conversation and really the backdrop to the law here. Yes, I, and, and I can't speak, uh, you know, intelligently to anything legal uh, and certainly not in the US, um, but uh, for sure in terms of the, the trust issue and the, the fear of, of the reporting, et cetera, um, I, I know that, um, you know, with Title IX and the legislation that, that is happening for the criminal um, aspect of things, the, the big gap that is probably left to look at would be under college, right? So, so all the, the younger, um, you know, the, the younger athletes, athletes who are not covered by uh, by the legislation, uh, whether the Ted Stevens Act with the Olympic Committee or the um, or or line for for college sports, and maybe uh, something to look at is something around whispers, 
uh, that might be something to uh, to initiate and and to make sure that is is on the radar uh, when it comes to you know protecting people who do the reporting, and and like um, uh, you know like the dean said this morning, uh, the number the percentage of people doing false reporting is. Uh, extremely low and and we're talking two to three percent maybe um and and so you know no one wants to be put on uh, in the limelight when it comes to these things you know these courageous survivors who talk to us about these things um you know they they, they would rather not have to uh, talk about this and so in the process of a litigation or a complaint and you have to come forward and, and all of a sudden you have to deal with all the each and I mean this is not something that people um, are looking to do and so that's why that percentage is so low and that's why it's important to believe so I think in terms of the trust to build is you do the best you can culture and and around the organization and you try to you know have an external arm and independence in the reporting uh, independent in the intake of the claim and in the treatment of the claim uh, that's, uh, that's what organizations I know in, in Canada uh, have to do because we don't have yet um, a government with the courage to actually have an uh, independent national organization crossing our fingers and a change real soon. Um, but, you know, I've been holding my breath for three years. So, yeah, no. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, that's, that's really what you can do is you put safeguards in where you have independence and third parties looking at these things so you can at least you know get people to be to feel safe coming forward and you ha you just have to embody that that language but it, it, it's really difficult uh, there's no doubt yeah thank you for those thoughts um we have another question in the chat um so it appears to be an uphill battle, as we've heard from uh, multiple of you, to create and pass legislation that penalizes inaction in the face of abuse. Um, perhaps, Brian, you could take this question. Um, are there any efforts to incentivize reporting, such as statutory guarantees to protect reporters' confidentiality, um, safeguarding from retaliation? Um, perhaps this could be an important first step towards compelling action against com complicity. Yeah, it's a great question. When we were doing the 911 bill that required reporting, we also folded into our Good Samaritan statute actions that were taken under that proposed bill so that if someone uh, was driving by the scene of an accident, to take an absurd example, if someone was driving by the scene of an accident, saw that there had been somebody seriously injured and pulled out their cell phone and called in an attempt to call 911, actually called grandma, and then ended up talking for 15 or 20 minutes to grandma and forgot all about the emergency, they wouldn't be in a position to be held liable either civilly or criminally for their negligence in failing to complete the 911 assistance competently. We also uh, are building into this bill that we're talking about right now, um, a, a shield on uh, liability for uh, reporting in good faith when it find when when there is later it's later determined that there are not grounds to believe abuse actually existed so the reporting in good faith uh, and problems that that may cause for individuals does not allow those individuals who were eventually aggrieved because they were wrongfully accused of abuse to hold responsible the individual who made the report in good faith so there are some uh, guardrails that you need to put in place to make sure that individuals who are doing their best to comply with their either moral or ethical or legal obligations are not uh, uh, and, and fail in for one reason or another uh, or or just end up mm -hmm. reporting abuse when abuse, abuse doesn't exist are not penalized in any way. And the incentivizing that's referred to uh, would be the Good Samaritan aspect of it. There's also in between this failure to report completely and having no consequence or seeing abuse take place and uh, the, the deliberate indifference, the criminal charges that can come on the other end of the spectrum, of course, there's also civil liability, which uh, is sort of occupying some of the ground in the gray area between those two extremes. 
And Emily, if I could speak to the question briefly also, um, because the questioner mentioned retaliation. Um, I mean, one thing that is so complex legally here is that there is a patchwork of various laws, civil and criminal, that may be implicated by these situations. And um, that's sort of a nature of our federal system. We have state law, we have federal law, also a nature of the legal system and splitting off things between civil and criminal. So it's all very complicated, I must say. And that complexity does not always work very well for survivors. But um, to go back to the legal piece that I've been speaking to, which is a civil federal law, okay? And it's a civil civil right. federal law that treats this matter as a civil rights issue. And it applies to all levels of education, higher ed as well as K through 12 if the schools receive federal oh. funds. And so for there is Title IX coverage wherever sports are in schools for athletes in sexual assault and abuse. Okay. But in the specific question about protection for reporters is a very important one. And one thing that I will say is that Title IX as a matter of law prohibits retaliation. And retaliating against a complainant is forbidden. It is a whole separate violation of Title IX. It could be enforced through OCR. It could be enforced through court. Of course, it can be difficult to prove retaliation. And sometimes, especially when retaliation is subtle and undertaken by peers, right? So, for example, other, other athletes kind of giving the cold shoulder to an athlete who reports something that others want to keep hidden. That can be a very uncomfortable situation. And it can be, um, in terms of how the law sees it, sometimes too subtle for the law, for example, to go after, uh, especially in the realm of peer retaliation, subtle forms of that. But even that said, if peer retaliation is severe enough, there's an obligation on the institution, if it knows about it, to take action to stop that retaliation. So again, I can't say this all works perfectly in practice, but I do want people to know Title IX does forbid retaliation. And then the rules on confidentiality get very complex. Let me just say briefly, Title IX does not tell schools who has to be a mandatory reporter. Many institutions have taken the position that everybody's a mandatory reporter. Any employee who learns must report. There's frankly a big debate about that whether that is better for bulletproofing for schools or better for survivors, because that can chill reports. If a survivor wants to tell someone trusted but is not ready for it to be let out and wants to keep it confidential, sweeping mandatory reporting rules at institutions can chill those reports. On the other hand, um, they can help perhaps get a report out if an institution is trying to sweep it under the rug. It's a bit of a complex situation. There's been a lot of work more recently to find some middle ground, something like survivor directed or student directed reporting. But the most important thing is clarity about who is a mandatory reporter and who is confidential. And Title IX doesn't provide a clear cut rule on that. That is up to institutions. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, we are almost out of time, but I wanted to give all the panelists just the chance to add any final um, or closing thoughts that you had that you didn't have the chance to say throughout the panel. If anything, you, you don't have to. <laughs> My only thought would be that, that we, we've got to do a better job of making sure that people understand the really nuanced and complex psychological and sociological components of this. This, this is understanding how people respond. I mean, I think of the Floyd George situation where you had a, a police officer literally killing an individual in front of three other police officers while bystanders are saying, you're killing this man. Please stop kneeling on his neck this way. You're killing him. The other officers didn't do anything. Why is that? Well, these are deep waters in terms of how we relate to each other uh, and to ourselves individually from a psychological and sociological perspective. I just think we need to continue to talk about it and raise consciousness and awareness of how uh, 
challenging are those circumstances can be in terms of uh, exposing other individuals and groups to tremendous harm because um, that happens and figure out ways to have more intelligent discussions about getting beyond that as human beings. Right. Uh, and and um, thank you, uh, Mr. King. I think um, that's, uh, you know, that that's a loaded answer. And but it, it's right there where it needs to be, because, you know, uh, and that's when I say, you know, to become a best in class organization, you have to be ethically led and expert supported and you have to center the safeguarding, but you have to be trauma informed. And that's a little bit to what you were talking about how um, how the impact of the non-action or the wrong action or the, you know, just being complete jerks in an organization and, and, and being complicit or being a predator, all of these things, the, the impact you have, the trauma that you, um, that you, you make people go through is, is a long lasting thing. You know, I, I invite people to go um, look at the ACE is aware website in California, um, the Surgeon General in California. She's she's like my hero. Uh, she's just unbelievable, and she's done so much to make people understand that trauma, especially in childhood, has long-lasting impacts that are way beyond um, mental health issues, but also cardiovascular, immune system, etc. And then it impacts you socially. And then it dominoes on your life and your friends and your new family. So, you know, the responsibility is huge. And, and now that we know better, we must do better, period, end of story. So, yes, I echo your thoughts, <laughs> Mr. King. And I'll just say briefly, we've talked about the need to change the culture and I would say one of the most important things about changing the culture is changing a culture that has for so long silenced and disbelieved and blamed survivors. And that is why I think the most important thing in change, whether it's legal, ethical, policy, the most important thing in changing um, the culture and changing our, our structures that respond to these problems is hearing from survivors. The survivor stories are transformative. They really are. They directly challenge the culture of silencing and disbelief and trivializing. And to the extent that we have had positive change in the law over part of this history, it really has been because the survivor stories have um, come out um, into the open. And so it is so important that conferences like this um, hear from survivors. And so I just uh, uh, applaud all of you there at Utah for um, hosting such an important conversation. Thank you so much once again to all of our panelists. Um, I think you made it clear how intersectional and complicated this issue is and also left us with some important perspectives and ideas for how we can continue to move this work forward. So thank you so much. And now we will have about a 42 minute break um, resuming at 1.45 p.m. after lunch. Thank you all so much. <laughs>